Hi everyone. Welcome to the first ever games track at Google I.O. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Google I.O. is kind of a big deal to Google. And so having our first ever games dedicated track is huge. This is the first of many talks for game developers this week. So make sure to look for the deep technical sessions, sign up for a game review, and check out the demos in the garage. So I'm Tian, and I run product and UX for Google Play. Like many of you, probably got your start in computer science because of games. For me, I was four years old when I started playing and programming on an Atari 800, and it has changed my life. I've been lucky enough to help build the Nintendo GameCube, the Xbox 360, and the PlayStation 4. And it has just been a huge pleasure to help bring better and better games to more and more people around the planet. Now I'm here at Google, where collectively we address the largest population of gamers on the planet. What we know as game developers and platform developers is that games need reach. The more people you can reach, the better your chances for success. That means being able to get your games running wherever players are, on their phones, tablets, laptops, TVs, everywhere. We want to help bring your games to everyone on the planet. And we want to help you, the developers, to be as successful as possible. We'll share how Google Cloud can help your game scale with their amazing infrastructure and bring new capabilities like ML to all platforms. Then you'll also hear how Stadia plans to change the way players access games and how you, the developers, can reach all those players. But first, I'm going to start with how Android and Google Play can help you reach more devices and more people. Android is the most popular operating system on the planet and powers the largest game platform ever built. We reach over 2.5 billion active devices, about half of which are playing games. This number continues to grow as we expand the ecosystem to new markets and bring new players into the fold. A lot of recent growth has come from emerging markets, such as India, Brazil, and Indonesia. And they're not just playing your games, they're monetizing. New paying users in emerging markets have tripled year over year on Google Play. Now, these users may be hard to reach. They may be using unique payment options or devices that you haven't seen before. And of course, all those devices are running an OS that wasn't actually built for games. We want to help make it easier. We're committed to helping you achieve your vision by making it simpler to build, optimize, and monetize your games. Let's start with some recent work in tools and performance, an area we continue to, continue to invest heavily in. It's also near and dear to my heart. I'm an old school console and game optimization guy. I want access to every byte and cycle that the hardware can offer. So we're making improvements to memory management and multi-core performance. In Android Q, our new memory compaction improvements mean your game can stay resident longer and have more memory to work with. We're also working with OEMs to mitigate multi-core scheduling issues so their devices can be more predictable. We know we have a lot more to do here, especially in profiling tools, and we're working on it. Now, touchscreen touch screen games in particular can really expose input latency. Every frame and millisecond counts for the best experience. We've been working closely with developers like Kabam and NetEase to understand the underlying issues with the Android display pipeline. And we have something new to show you today. We're launching the Android Frame Pacing API. This synchronizes your game code and the device's display pipeline, resulting in lower input latencies 
and much smoother frame rates. This is integrated into Unity, and you can check it out in the garage. And also, please check out Fran's hilarious talk on Android optimization later. You'll go into much more detail. We're working on many new exciting features to help you measure and tune performance, so stay tuned. Let's now talk about how we can help you get your game discovered. Now, the Google Play Console provides many tools helping you target, optimize, and monitor your game across the Android fleet. And while it does enough to fill 10, 20 talks, I'm just going to focus on a few recent updates most relevant to all of you. Pre-registration. It's a best practice for building pre-launch demand to reach players earlier in their lifecycle. We launched to general availability at GDC, and many developers have been using this to great success. Today, I'm pleased to announce that we're expanding this feature with the launch of pre-registration rewards. Now you can give users special in-app items as a reward for pre-registering. And this can have a powerful effect. Nexon recently used this feature for their new game, Faith. And players who received the reward had over 20% higher retention at day 30. Now, to help optimize your acquisition funnel, custom store listings has let you tailor your page based on the country a visitor is coming from. We're expanding this functionality. So now you can customize based on pre-registration state and install state. So here in the middle is an example where a lapsed user might be enticed back by a new game mode. And this can drive reinstalls. We plan to launch this in the near future and encourage you to sign up for the EAP today. Now, we've also extended store listing experiments to work with custom store listings. So you can test and optimize all these variants. This was the number one feature request from our EAP, and we're very happy to deliver it to you. Another way that we help drive acquisition is by reducing install friction. For example, with Google Play Instant, players can jump into a demo of your game in seconds without installing. And we've seen that developers who build great instant experiences can, install their, can improve their install conversion by up to 20%. Streamlining game delivery is another way we help reduce install friction. So we've already re-architected how apps get delivered with the Android app bundle. This has let us tailor delivery to a user's device, sending only the necessary bits. And this results in considerable size savings. Apps that switch to the bundle see an 11% install uplift. Now, this is one way we actually help you reach those users in emerging markets. They often don't have as much mobile data or storage as those of us in the developed markets. I'm happy to say that we're extending the app bundle now to include game assets. You publish a single artifact containing your binary and its assets, and Play will keep those assets up to date just like we do with your binary. If you sign up for the EAP today, you'll soon be able to include up to a gigabyte of game assets in your app bundle. And we're not done. We're working hard on additional delivery options, allowing greater flexibility, larger game bundles, and the same optimized device targeting that we provide elsewhere. Now, reaching all those users does nothing if your game isn't up to snuff. Last year at I.O., we launched category benchmarks. So you could compare your metrics with your category. We heard your feedback that the categories were too broad, and it was hard to draw meaningful comparisons. So today, we're introducing developer-selected peer benchmarks. Now you can compare your game against a set of 8 to 12 peers of your choice and look for potential areas for improvement. Play Console is the only place where you can find this level of benchmarking accuracy, 
And we built a brand new benchmarking platform to work with all the important metrics across the console. Now, the tools I've mentioned help you build, promote, and distribute your games. Let me share some updates to our billing platform. Since last I.O., we've added seller support in over 30 new countries. We've also added 20 new carrier billing partnerships, expanding our DCB reach to over a billion active devices. Again, this is critical in helping those new users in emerging markets transact on the platform. We're also constantly running campaigns to optimize the purchase flow, reduce latency, drive growth, and reduce cart abandonment. We're seeing a lot of you see success with in-game subscriptions. Now, I used to help run a subs business at Hulu, and I learned just how hard it is to do this really well. So at Google, we've been building all the tricks of the trade into the platform. And tomorrow, we'll be talking about several new features to help you manage your subs business. If you'd like to learn more, please attend our talks or check out the demos in the garage. So you've built a high-performance game. You've minimized its size. Now it's all about getting discovered. Let me share some of the changes we've made recently on Play to help you reach more people. Now, with all the creativity and innovation that goes into a game, we know it's impossible to convey all of that in a single app icon. We need to show the actual gameplay. And today on the Play Store, you may have to go through many layers to see what a game is actually about. So we're doing more to bring the soul of your game to the players right on the home page. We're showing more of your screenshots, trailers, and videos through several new units. And it is working. In some cases, we see click-through rates more than double. Now, another important discovery signal is your game's rating. For years, you have told us that you want a rating based on what your game is today, not what it was years ago. And we agree. We know how hard you, and how much energy you put into improving your games year over year. So I'm happy to share that we're updating the way that average rating is calculated. Instead of a lifetime cumulative value, your new score will place more weight on recent ratings. Now, users will not see this new rating until August, but you can all preview your new rating in the Play Console today. We're also experimenting with showing live ops events. This is a new way to reach more players and drive engagements with tournaments and sales or after a major update. If you're interested, please sign up for the EAP. Now, I've only mentioned a few of the many things we're doing to help you. To learn even more, please attend the What's New in Google Play tomorrow at 11.30. We hope you take advantage of these tools and continue to share feedback so we can continuously improve them. Now, I've talked about discovery and engagement on the Play Store, but off store is just as important. In 2018, over 50 billion hours of gaming-related content was watched on YouTube by an audience of over 200 million. Let me share some of the interesting insights we found. So 90% of gamers turn to YouTube every week to watch some gaming videos. I'm one of them. Yeah, thank you. And developers spend more than a quarter billion on influencer content. By connecting what we know about watch people viewing videos on YouTube with their actual install behavior on the Play Store, we can actually show the ROI for these campaigns. And it's pretty amazing. For every one person who watches a video, clicks the link, and installs a game, there are four more that do the same without clicking any links. They're not trackable. This 4x is an average and depends on the game and the nature of the video. But we've seen multipliers as high as 10x. So this is extremely valuable. And you can expect us to build more connective tissue between YouTube and all our game efforts. 
So I've just given you a small taste of how Play is helping you reach more players than ever before. Next, Sunil will tell you how Google Cloud is enabling new capabilities for game developers and helping them scale. Please welcome Sunil. Thank you, Tian. Uh, my name is Sunil Ryan, and I lead Google Cloud for Games. Tian talked a lot about reach, and games have never reached more players than they have today. In fact, I think we have about 2.4 billion players out there. And games have also become so popular that it's one of the world's most foremost form of entertainment these days. But with that level of reach comes complexity, right? So you're managing a game across dif different geographies, different languages, time zones, and to reach your players is becoming more and more challenging. Today's games are also played across multiple platforms. And you know, cross-platform play is going to start to become very vital. Thirdly, the speed and scale of your games is just growing faster and faster. What used to take probably months or years to get to 10 million users, takes it just happens in a matter of days right now. And lastly, your game is just not a game anymore. It's an ecosystem of players, content developers, viewers, audiences, et cetera, that are engaging with your game. So you need to think about all these different users. What does that mean, though, for you as a developer? It means you need to partner with somebody who can simplify the complexity of managing all this infrastructure so you can focus on what you love most, which is build great games. And what does that mean? Uh, we think it means a few things. One, your players who play the game deserve to enjoy the games in the best possible conditions. So uh, your infrastructure needs to be global, scalable, and reliable, and it needs to keep up with the demand, run quickly, and run globally. But managing this infrastructure can also take a lot of effort. It shouldn't just be scalable. It should be really easy to manage and portable. That's why we abstract a lot of the messy things about creating this, uh, managing this infrastructure so you can focus on building your game. Now, on top of this infrastructure, number two, is we also are building platform agnostic services so you don't have to rewrite all the different backend services depending on which platform your game is actually running on. And third, um, because games produce so much data, uh, when it, when you, if you think about storing events every day from games, you need to find a way to understand more about your players and your game performance. And you need to have a team that can sift through all this massive amounts of data and analyze it at scale. And we want to make it easier for you to extract these insights from these games. So let's go deeper into each one of these points. The basis of everything what Google Cloud does or is doing is its global infrastructure and network. We've invested massive amounts of money across the globe in building regions to support these data centers. Uh, we've got 20 cloud regions across the world, and we have three more in the way in Jakarta, Seoul, and Salt Lake City. And these regions are connected with thousands and thousands of miles of privately owned fiber optic cables. In fact, we also have 13 undersea cable investments across the world. But what does this mean in terms of for you as game developers? You want your game servers to be running as close to your players as possible. And this is what should be the backbone if you're truly building a global game. And hosting these games on global infrastructure will help ensure that your players have a really smooth experience, see no latency issues, and your services are always close to the players. Some of the world's largest games are actually running on, on, on this infrastructure. Apex Legends, which I'm sure many of you have played, had a great launch by running the game servers on Google Cloud Compute Engine with the help of our friends at Multiplay. Multiplay is a managed partner of Google Cloud that provides a full suite of services orchestration services and scaling tech to help host your game servers. Apex accumulated a you know, million players in about eight hours and almost 10 million players in about three days. So when talking about reach, this is the type of global scalability that Google Cloud can offer your game. Seamless performance, so you know, wherever your players may be. It's not only Apex. We also announced at GDC, Google Cloud was picked as the cloud provider to host game servers for the highly anticipated sequel, The Division 2. Massive, which is a Ubisoft studio, and Google Cloud work together to use the cloud compute engine and deliver a smooth online experience for these players. In fact, we had our Google Cloud engineers sit with the Massive 
engineers in the same room to make sure that they had a successful launch. We realize also that many of your successful games are already running on other infrastructure. But the needs for global games really needs a different approach. We're firm believers in giving developers flexibility to run their backend infra infrastructure where it makes most sense for you. That's why open source is a key part of our strategy, not just in gaming, but also in Google Cloud. Uh, we think we know a little bit more about open source because we invented Kubernetes. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Kubernetes, Kubernetes is an open source system for deploying and running software at scale. Because Kubernetes is open source, it gives you the freedom to take advantage of running your software, whether it's an on-premise, whether it's in a hybrid environment, or a public cloud infrastructure with the GCP or something else. This helps you so you don't get locked into one cloud provider, and you can move workloads as you wish. Uh, when you run Kubernetes, though, the best way to take advantage is to basically have the people who actually built it run it for you as well. So we're taking this open source approach, and we're using it to build game-specific services and solutions. And we're not doing it alone. We're doing it with industry leaders like Ubisoft and Unity to bring you these game services to life. Agones, which is a game server, open source dedicated game server hosting solution, was built on top of Kubernetes with the flexibility to tailor the needs of your multiplayer game. You get native capabilities to create, run, and um, scale these dedicated game servers on Kubernetes using standard Kubernetes toolings and APIs. Building uh, Agones on top of Kubernetes lets you also choose where you want this to run, whether it's on-prem, whether it's on our cloud or other clouds. We also uh, co-founded a, a matchmaking framework called OpenMatch with Unity. And we call it framework because we want to take away the repetitive elements of a matchmaker so you can focus on the main things, which is the match logic. And we give you the flexibility for you to put your match logic in. So if you stop by our garage demo area, we have experts that can talk you, to, uh, talk you through both Agones as well as OpenMatch. We embrace open source uh, because we want everybody to use these solutions. You don't just have to be a large company with hundreds of employees to use these solutions. Super Solid, uh, a relatively small company, is using Agones in their newest game, Snake Rivals, as an example. We also want to make it easy for you to deploy these services into your games. So we actually have it available now in our Google Cloud Marketplace where you can launch Agones with just a few clicks. So I encourage you to check it out. Once you've had your game up and running, we talked about infrastructure, we talked about platform services. But now that you have the games up and running, you have a new challenge. I have all this data. And how am I going to manage and optimize my game with this data and, and think about user acquisition? Today's successful games, as you know, generate billions and billions of events. And as developers, you need to find a way to harness this data. But simply managing and analyzing this data, in, in fact, is not enough. With BigQuery, our globally scalable, fully managed data warehouse, you can have access to the data warehouse that keeps up with the data volume and velocity, enabling your data analyst to get results really fast. Not only that, we also have ML built into BigQuery that you can, take, you can have your data analysts start to build machine learning models without really having a PhD in doing so. Um, so as I said, Google Cloud's goal is to enable everyone to use AI and ML. So we've built a, a suite of products uh, depending on how nascent or advanced your capabilities are in ML. So if you look on the left-hand side, you have prepackaged, powerful AI solutions that you can just embed within your game. So think about like a translation API that you can just ha help translate your game chats in real time. Uh, on the middle layer, we also have built new products. For example, we launched a product called Cloud Auto ML that because it's a technology that help, helps build custom ML models for you, all you need to do is prepare the data and set the objective in terms of what you're trying to achieve. And it builds the, it builds the machine learning models for you. And lastly, for people who have advanced capabilities in-house, uh, you've got a lot of data scientists and ML scientists and experts, you can write your own custom models with TensorFlow and use the cloud machine learning engine as a platform which is optimized to run machine, uh, to run machine learning models. 
So solutions like Cloud ML have really made AI experts even more productive and helped beginners who are starting with ML build powerful AI systems that they could only dream of. Not only are we providing tools, we also see the potential of AI and ML across different phases in the game lifecycle. Uh, for example, whether it's game development, so you have like NPCs, QA testing, in your user acquisition and retention uh, processes, as well as improving the in-game experience. And large companies like King, Square Enix, DNA, Netmarble are using Google Cloud to get real insights and embed these AI solutions into their game. Let's walk through some of these use cases and examples so we bring this to life. King, uh, you know, famous producer of Candy Crush, is using BigQuery to, to analyze massive amounts of data. They have something like 70 billion events that are produced every day that they store and they sift through all this data. But one of the cool use cases that we've seen coming out of King is they've used this data to simulate player testing. Um, models are deployed to simulate hundreds of game rounds in parallel, allowing developers to figure out how hard or easy are the different games based on the different skill levels of players. If they had to do this with real players and games, this used to take them months or weeks uh, in order to come up with like, how they should design the challenge level by different segment types. And now they can do it in a matter of hours. So this is the types of things that help them save money so they can focus more on creating as opposed to waiting for data to load and have these tests all done. So this is one example where King is actually using it for play testing. Another use case that we have seen is DNA, which you know, was breathing new, which with AI was breathing new life into a three-year-old game. The game was Gyakuten Otolonia. It's a PvP strategy game uh, where before starting a, a battle, you have to construct a deck. And each deck has to have about 16 characters. So, you know, they have all these different characters, so they had to, the players have to think about 3,000 different combinations. And as a result, you know, you have a steep learning curve, and there's a lot of churn happening in the game. So what DNA did is use BigQuery, our TensorFlow, with a custom model, and with Cloud Machine Learning Engine to help build a recommendation engine and an AI training bot to help onboard the users so they could you know, um, guide the users to build the right deck so they can start to play the game. And this, this is in an existing three-year-old game, so it reduced churn and now they've had even more downloads, about 23 million, since they made these changes, and it's continuing to grow. So you can embed new life, basically, in an old game with AI as well. The last uh, example I'm going to talk about is Netmarble, which uses uh, AI and ML uh, across a wide variety of use cases. Uh, they've actually built an AI-dedicated team to push the boundaries of how AI and ML can be used in games. Uh, one interesting problem that they solved is a lot of you game developers spend hours and hours building games, but the last thing you want to see is revenue leakage. So for example, uh, Netmarble used a model to improve their cheat detection services. Uh, they, used models, uh, they used the same models across both their MMORPG games as well as their strategy games. And as a result, it helped them retain the high spend players because they had ways to detect anomalies in the game to, pretend, uh, to protect cheats from entering the game. So these are some of the examples. We're still in early days as to how AI and ML will change the game industry. But hopefully, you've gotten a little bit of a taste of to what some of the leading companies are doing with AI and ML on Google Cloud. So TN talked a lot about mobile developers and helping them reach a broad audience than ever. I just discussed how you can manage the complexity of reaching an audience with global, reliable, scalable infrastructure and leverage new capabilities like AI and ML across all platforms. Uh, next, I would like to hand it over to John Justice from Stadia to talk about how you can reach players and devices in new ways with PC and console type games. Welcome, John. Hi. Hi, folks. I'm John Justice. I run the product team for Stadia. What an exciting time to be in games. Today, we're going to talk about how Stadia will help you reach more users on more devices. In March at GDC, we announced our vision for the future of games with the Stadia platform reveal. The response from the game development community has been remarkable. 
We've had thousands of companies apply for access to our developer program. Thank you to everyone who's applied on Stadia.dev. We're rolling out access to developers purposefully over the coming months with a focus on making a great experience for you no matter what the size is of your studio. So if you signed up, we appreciate your patience. But I want to step back for a minute and talk about the foundations of Stadia, why it exists as a platform. For PC and console developers, the games you're making, they're getting more complex, they're getting richer, higher fidelity, and frankly, more expensive to make than ever before. Now, more than ever, you need to reach more players. Until Stadia, that reach has been gated by the cost of hardware. Hardware that needs to be upgraded for hundreds or thousands of dollars every few years. That generational reset limits your reach as developers. So until now, you've faced a dilemma. Build a game that takes advantage of the latest tech, delivering the best visuals, the 4K visuals, the massive worlds, all of that. Or maximize reach by targeting the lowest common denominator in your hardware. And if you wanted to reach players on different devices, you'd usually just have to rewrite your game. You have to write your game multiple times. Stadia removes those dilemmas. As developers, you're always building on the latest hardware. You only have to build your game once to run across devices. And your players never have to buy an expensive console or PC. And they never have to upgrade. And with Stadia's YouTube integration, you can reach players wherever they are and bring them into the game. Your games deserve to be experienced by the widest audience possible on as many devices as possible and as seamlessly as possible. So how does Stadia actually work? And more importantly, how do you make a game for the platform? OK, how does it work? A player presses a button on the Stadia controller that fires the input via Wi-Fi to the Stadia instance in the, in the Google Data Center. We process that input, run the game logic, render the frame up to 4K 60 HDR, encode the frame, and transmit it back to the player. If you're building a game using back-end servers, say multiplayer, you can use whatever cloud provider you like for that back-end server. But if you want the best performance, security, and value, you'll want to use GCP. For more on that, go talk to my friend Sunil, who was just on. That Stadia instance, the hardware running your game in the Google Data Center, it runs Linux with Vulkan graphics. Now, when you're developing for Stadia, you'll use the tools and workflow that you're already used to. The Stadia plugin for Visual Studio adds a Stadia target, just like any other platform. For shaders, we've worked with Microsoft on the DirectX shader compiler to enable HLSL to Spear V compilation to make the transition to Vulkan as simple as possible. We've integrated the open source tools you already use, including the LLVM compiler, RenderDoc for graphics debugging, Valgrind for debugging and profiling, and Gapid, which we've optimized with the Android team uh, to work well for Stadia. We've also integrated a large and continuously growing list of middleware, like Havoc, CryEngine, and Audio Kinetic. And of course, that list includes Unity and Unreal. Regardless of what engine you're using, once your game is built, you upload the Stadia game package to your development instance, which streams it to players. For those development instances, we give you a few choices. If you want to run your game in our cloud, you can use instances in our data center. If you prefer running it locally, we have Stadia dev workstations. And if you want a quad instance service server to be shared in your studio for your dev team, we have those too. So whether it's your cloud, our cloud, or at your desk, we support your workflow. As you get into testing your games for Stadia, you'll find more of the benefits that come with cloud gaming development. No more pushing builds to hundreds of testers and waiting for them to download. Instead, you'll upload a build to the cloud and just send out a link. The test team clicks that link, and they're in the game. This means faster iteration, tighter feedback loops during this critical stage. All of that's managed through the Stadia Partner Portal, which you can actually check out today live in the garage here at I.O. So now we've covered at a high level 
How do you, as a developer, make a game for Stadia using a single code base, reaching desktops, laptops, tablets, phones, and TVs? If you want to dive more into the tech behind Stadia, we have a deep dive session coming up at 3 PM at the garage. It's being given by our playability team. It speaks directly to the software and hardware that powers Stadia streaming. I highly recommend you all attend. OK, so as you move from development to testing and finally your game, you'll eventually want to unleash your game on the world. When you think about launching that game, Stadia's YouTube's integration are designed to let you reach more players in new ways. So let's talk about how a player finds a game today. The number one place where they do that is YouTube. The number one activity people do before buying a game in the world is watch a video of that game on YouTube. Until Stadia, after watching that video, someone would have to jump through hoops to buy it and then wait to play it. With Stadia, they go from YouTube to play within moments. And taking that further, if you build state share into your game, players can not only jump into your game, but they can jump into that exact compelling moment that they were watching. State share enables you as a developer to compile the metadata of your game world, things like a player's armor or inventory, the puzzle they were on, the opponent they were facing, any of those, all of those into a clickable link. That link can be sent anywhere on the internet, and someone with that link, they'll jump into the game at that exact same spot, the very moment that got them excited about your game. After someone's in your game, they'll want to play with their friends, no matter what platform they're on. With Stadia, we support cross-platform play and cross-platform progression. We leave the choice to you, but we will do everything we can to make it possible. Today, we covered how you can use Stadia to reach more users on more devices. With a single code base, a powerful workflow that meets you where you are, powerful YouTube integration, and open policies, you can get your games into the hands of players everywhere. Stadia will be launching later this year in the US, Canada, UK, and much of Europe. If you're interested in learning more about the platform and applying to access for our developer platform, please go to stadia.dev now and apply. Thank you for coming to the first of many games tracks at I.O. No matter if you're focused on mobile game development, scaling your infrastructure to support a global audience, or you're building your next great high-end game experience, Google is dedicated to supporting you and reaching more users with your devices. Please be sure to stop by the garage at I.O. to learn more. At Google, we're here to be your partner. We won't always be perfect, but our commitment to you is to remain vigilant, remain humble, and always listen to your feedback. After all, without the support of you and the rest of the game developer ecosystem, everything you've heard today simply would not exist. For Tian and Sunil, as well as the rest of Google, thank you so much for your attention today, and have a great I.O.